Um, and here we talked about, we can start with that. And I'm gonna kick things off uh, with um, a quick introduction. I am Jeff Hester. I am the uh, founder of SoCal Hiker and the Six Pack of Peaks Challenge. And this is the, our 10th uh, weekly Zoom happy hour. So we've been doing this kind of, uh, we kicked this off when we were, the stay at home order was put in place. So while we couldn't get together face to face, we could at least get together uh, virtually and share what we're, you know, share our love of the outdoors basically. And uh, we thought this week would be a great idea to talk about outdoor photography. And so I'm really thankful that Jason is here because he knows a few things about outdoor photography. And uh, he was also in the photo of the event uh, cover. So if you saw the guy by the lake, that's Avalanche Lake in Glacier National Park. And Jason's showing what a real photographer looks like. Um, and <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you have some great advice and tips and stuff like that. Um, I can share my own gear and the few tips that I have um, and and then we'll just open it up so people who have suggestions or ideas or questions we can, we'll have a chance to do that. Uh, a couple things of housekeeping. I will recommend that in the chat that you click the, the chat button on the bottom and open that up on the right hand side and you might just you can use that to share links to things that we want to uh, you can hear my dogs in the background. You might share, uh, we might share links in there, or if you have a question and, you know, we're in the middle of something, you want to make sure we don't forget that, you know, you can post the question there as well. And, um, or if you have something you want to share, that's a great way to do that is put it in the chat. Okay, let's see. So we're recording now and um, I'm going to kick things off with a quick toast. So if you have a glass, of whatever it might be, H2O, or in this case, I'm drinking a, a, um, a farmhouse red blend from the Pacific Oregon, actually. And uh, we will raise a glass to the reopening of the outdoors and future outdoor adventures. So cheers to that. Hmm. Oh, that's nice. All right. So um, outdoor photography, I have a quick couple quick polls I want to pull up and just to see kind of where everybody's at. Um, where do you see your uh, level of outdoor photography experience? Beginner, intermediate, advanced, or professional? And um, I would consider myself, for some reason, because I'm running the, the meeting, I can't vote on this. I would probably put myself maybe, you know, in between intermediate and advanced, somewhere in there. Maybe advanced. I don't know. It's... I, I tend to be pretty basic in what I, the tools that I use. I don't get too fancy, but um, um, I wouldn't consider myself professional either, so. Well, you kind of do get paid to a degree. I do, that's true, yeah. I mean, my, <laughs> all, the, all the photos on SoCal Hiker are almost, probably 99% of them are my own, so I, uh, yeah, yeah, that is true. So maybe I should be a professional photographer. I, I could be considered that. All right, we've got, uh, I'm going to end the poll and we'll see where we're at. It's got about 33, about a third of the people who consider themselves a beginner, more than half an intermediate. Nobody's advanced, but we have a professional in the house. All right, is that Jason? <laughs> <laughs> ah, lucky guess. All right. I'll share the results there. <laughs> but he, he may be a professional photographer, but he can't get Zoom working on a regular Mac. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next, the next question I've got is uh, just really, and this isn't a judgment on your ability or anything else. It's just sort of what kind of camera or cameras do you use? And this is multiple choice. So it may depend on the situation. You might carry multiple cameras. I don't know. And there might be other options that I haven't, I didn't include film as an option. I kind of figured nobody's really good at film. Uh, mirrorless would have, mirrorless would have probably been the one you'd, you, you'd want to put up that's not on that list. Yeah, okay, so uh, that's a great, Great point. Um, I was kind of considering mirrorless as, you know, in the same category as digital SLR. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a kind of digital. Essay. Yeah. I well, mean, it's not a single lens refresh. Pull. It's it's mirrorless. You're right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but you know there is no mirror in the mirrorless, so it's kind of. Yeah. Got it. The DSLR, the big, the, the big difference is the mirror. So it's yeah, you know, it, yeah. It, you know. Okay, good point. Yeah. So if you if you're using mirrorless, just pick digital SLR and forget. Yeah. Because <laughs> okay, that's actually one of my cameras. Is <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, almost half using a smartphone. A uh, small percentage using a point and shoot. Nobody's using a GoPro. Very interesting. I do. Okay, you didn't select. I can't, I can't respond. I'm a co-host with you. Oh, dang it. Um, yeah, so, yeah, GoPros, great little devices, portable, waterproof, fun. Uh, digital SLRs or mirrorless cameras um, would be like the more, I guess, more complicated in some ways. They could they be. They don't have to be. They don't have to be. There's Yeah, most of them are pretty automatic if you want to use, use yeah. that. They all have auto modes, so you know yeah. you put it on that, you know, and pretty good. <laughs> so there's the results. Um, now, just as a per per perspective, um, you know, when I started SoCalHiker.net, um, I was using a Canon point and shoot. I forget the model. I don't know, but it was the you know like the a standard point and shoot camera. And the, the reasons for that is smartphones, just the cameras weren't quite good enough. The point and shoot was small and compact and you could, you know, just carry a couple extra batteries. And I used that on the John Muir Trail and it worked super great. Um, but you know, they've pretty much been killed by the smartphone, you know, that whole market. I mean, people don't really carry point and shoot. So you're either using a, like a GoPro or some kind of action cam a smartphone or a uh, digital SLR or, slash or uh, mirrorless camera. And mirrorless, probably even more so just because in the outdoors, they're lighter and you know tend to be a little bit more uh, portable. So there you go. Uh, we'll stop sharing there. And all right, so um, Large format. Oh, geez. Will, are you using large format? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> my uh, my father-in-law is a little artsy. You know, he's got an artistic bent. And he was doing large format photos. Not, you know, he was doing stuff in the city of San Francisco, you know, just kind of going around and setting that up. And it was just, a, it was such a process. You know, you have to stabilize it with this, you know, huge tripod and weights and, you know, it's a, it's expensive and all of that. So, um, but he, he's, he's moved on from that hobby. Um, anybody using film by any chance at all? No. All right. Yeah. Back in the, when I started, I was using, I was using, shooting mostly slides. So I was using uh, slide film. And then I would develop the, because uh, slides were cheaper to develop and, uh, or to process. And then, and then I could go through the slides and figure out which ones I wanted prints of and, and get those made. But uh, a long time ago. Allison's got a good film outdoor photo Instagram field bag. Awesome, yeah, Allison. Cool collection of, of photographs, all film specific. I don't shoot film myself, but I just, want to kind of get back into it it's obviously a little more expensive and you know time consuming um but i think the image quality is is really great yeah mm -hmm. there there is a quality to film that the digital's kind of surpassed it in a lot of like if you just want to look at like resolution and look at things like that but there is a certain quality about film um but it is a lot more complicated and the sad thing is a lot of the the old film stocks they, they run in and out of production so like if you had a favorite slide film or a couple of favorite slide films, a lot of them aren't made anymore. Some of them they'll bring back though. Like I always shot a bunch of different Fuji slide films before I went digital and you know, they keep stopping production and then everyone cries about it. And a year or two later, they'll do another run of it, you know, and then they'll stop again. Cause, uh, so it is a little harder to find. There are a bunch out there, but it's nowhere near like what it was before the digital where there were just all kinds, you had so much choice of different like film, you know, different types of film to shoot. Yeah, for sure. So, so Jason is 
Uh, I was just going to ask, is, is Phil yeah. t making a comeback at all? Um, I, I don't know if so much a comeback. I think it's lingered, though, if that makes sense. It, it's sort of like everyone would have thought it would have been dead by now, but it hasn't died. It's still sort of kind of hanging out. And it might, may kind of go up and down a little bit, but it doesn't like um, – um, I, I come back is too strong. I think it, it'll, you know, little surges, little things. But it, I mean, the heart, the, the, the good thing about film is now you can buy all the old film cameras that were thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, for like hundreds go. of dollars. <laughs> Unless it's a Leica, in which case it, it will only go up in price and will never come down. But all the old Nikons, all the, the old, you know, Canons. And, I mean, yeah, you can get for like, you know, not a couple hundred bucks. So, I mean, it's kind of nice. You can get some, a lot of the old really pro high end good gear for next to nothing. So that's nice. But again, it's harder and harder to find labs. It's harder and harder to find, you know, um, find, you know, find actual film and, and the film stocks you want. So, but it is, it is still around and there's still, I think there's companies are still making money on it. Just not, you know, what they used to. So Jason had mentioned something that earlier about how the, the, the cameras on the smartphones are getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And uh, the picture of Jason that I used for the event cover, I took with an iPhone 7, I think an F iPhone 7 Plus um, a few years ago. Um, I'm now using an iPhone, um, what is this, iPhone 11, I guess, uh, the Pro, mm -hmm. with the, the three lenses. And so... Um, when I'm going out and doing a hike and I'm gonna document, I'm gonna to put together a trail guide and I'm doing it in the daylight, you know, like this is pretty much the primary camera that I use for those photos. And it does a pretty sharp, a pretty darn good job for most of the time. Um, where it's gonna fall down for me is like low light conditions or if I wanna do night sky photography, forget it. You know, I mean, you can play with it, but you're not gonna get great results. Um, but, you know, for just, you know, having a camera, this, I always carry this anyways. I'm using it, I'm using Gaia GP, GPS on here for tracking my hike and I'm taking photos and I might even take a few videos, but um, this is great, you know. And the one thing that I'll use along with that, I have a, um, uh, something called a quad lock case, which has a, a little locking mechanism on the back and then a small tripod with an adapter that just screw mounts on like any other camera, you know, mount. And I can basically just um, twist this and lock it in, in place on the, uh, on the tripod. And so now, you know, I've got something I can use. I can use the timer. I can use my Apple Watch to um, use it as a remote to Jeff, can photo. you put in like where do you get that and how much it was and all that? The quad lock case itself is is priced very comparable to other cases. I think it might be twenty something, you know, or somewhere in there. And then you know, all they have a whole range of different adapters. So like, there's the the tripod mount adapter. There's a car mount adapter. There's an armband. There's a bicycle handlebar adapter, et cetera, et cetera. And those are all depends, you know, depends on what it is and how much is it. Is, is that iPhone specific or do they offer for other phones? They offer for Android as well. So um, I don't know that they would cover every possible phone, but um, they have quite a few. So uh, I'll put a link in the. Jeff, how long have you had that? Like, have you taken I, on packing trips and is pretty durable? It's super durable. It is super durable. So I've had a quad lock case on my phones for probably five years and I've gone through multiple, you know, I've upgraded since then. So this one, whenever the iPhone 11 came out, I got a quad lock was like my next purchase. So I had to order it online because they didn't have them at the store right then, but um, really like that. And the other thing I, I would just say is a tripod is, is really a, a, a critical piece for capturing stuff and you can do even things with an iPhone like a, a time lapse and stuff like that and with a tripod and it's pretty serviceable it's not going to be pro quality but it's going to be it's going to be fun and, and and worth sharing with your friends and and uh, your followers so um, 
that's the nor number one thing that I use is my uh, my iPhone and a tripod. Um, the second thing that I'll use is occasionally I'll use a GoPro, and I I even have an old old one. It's a Hero Three Plus, so it's like I don't know four to five generations old, but it still does the job, and it's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so I can connect it to my iPhone for you know previewing if I want to and controlling it that way, or you know the little remote that they have with it. And um, it has a waterproof, you know, this is the version when they had a, a case that you had to put it in and they have a waterproof back and you can do underwater photography and stuff like that. You know, iPhone 11, you can go underwater, no problem. You know, I don't have issues with that. Um, but the primary reason you might use this would be for video, I guess. And I don't do as much video, so, uh, and it's a certain, you know, it's got that wide aspect that um, has a, a very different look. And then the, the final piece that I use is a mirrorless camera. And I've got a, one of the first um, mirrorless cameras from Canon that just the, I don't know, M something, but uh, like the M1, I guess it would have been, but, um, uh, these are nice if you want to do something a little bit, you know, higher level um, because you can have, uh, you can get into all of the manual controls. It does have an automatic mode like a point and shoot camera would, but it does give you a lot of control over the, you know, the, the aperture, the f-stop and all of those kind of, you know, the shutter speed and those sorts of things so that you can um, fine tune what you're doing. Um, and I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. I've, I've actually carried on, on a trip all three of these. And the one that I use the most, anyone want to venture a guess? Yeah. iPhone. I, it's easiest. IPhone. And so, um, you know, I really would only bring this if there's, if it's, if I'm specifically trying to get certain shots that I know I can't do with the iPhone. Um, Jason, you were, when we did the Wonderland Trail last year, I know you did some uh, night sky photography or you were attempting to with the overcast uh, skies, yeah. but uh, what, did, what did you use? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, on that trip, I had an A7R2 um, and an A6500. I brought Those are two Sony bodies. cameras, right? Both Sony. I now have an A7R4 I've upgraded. Well, the A6500, it was kind of already near its death on the Wonderland Trail and the Wonderland Trail officially killed it, so it's dead now. It's a very nice paperweight, um, oh. and I upgraded. So now my A7R2 is my backup, and my A7R4 is is the um, my main camera. Um, those are Sony; they're mirrorless for for, for people that, that that don't don't follow that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, but I do lug them, and you saw how much I know. Jeff knows how much extra extra stuff I carry when I when I do those trips. So um, yeah, how much does all the extra stuff weigh? Way? I shot a lot on the, on the, with the iPhone as well. So partly because I do, I always have used the top loader case and I've had the same one since I did the JMT and all these trips and it finally sort of broke like two days into, <laughs> into the uh, two or three days into our hike. It started to fall apart finally after all these years. So I, I kind of packed the good cameras in the, um, it was also raining. So I started packing those in the main pack. So I just had the iPhone w w was what was readily available. And then when we weren't hiking, or if what or if there was a good enough shot, I would stop and, and shoot with the uh, with the with take take out the better camera and shoot with that. <laughs> but how about uh, how about the rest of you? What are you guys using for uh, your photography, outdoor photography? I have a Sony Alpha Six Thousand. Mm -hmm. So and I I have two lenses. One's a 18 to 135 and the other is a 12 millimeter 2.0 f 2.0 um, wide angle lens that usually covers most most of my needs on on trails and i got this really cool new uh camera clip from peak designs where i'm able to just like wear my backpack and it attaches to the strap here i found that to be very useful it's one of these yeah. that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's the other piece of gear that, that I forgot to awesome. mention is the Peak Designs uh, clip, uh, which uh, it does a really nice job. You have to mount a little 
base on it on your camera and then it just it slides in and clips into your your backpack strap and if if i'm carrying the my uh, mirrorless camera i'll usually have it on the backpack strap or if it's not raining like it was in the wonderland trail um yeah. <laughs> you know where it's dry and and it's not an issue then you can do that i have a small a compact mirrorless but i haven't been bringing it because i'm not quite sure how to carry it you know i haven't been able to find i kind of would also like a case to protect it to some degree but i haven't been able to you know find something i'm happy with so i have a case i don't know if anyone else has solutions for this but i have a case for um my canon that is a two parts with snaps so you can it's not waterproof or anything like that but it is going to just basically give you some protection of the cape for the camera and so i can basically snap this all together and it's covering the whole thing and i can still put the the clip for the peak design thing on the bottom on the outside of this this case so you have access to the tripod mount through the bottom um, so you might look at something you know similar to that. It doesn't have to be that, but you know there's there's ways of doing that. And when you carry that, do you put the strap around your neck, or what do you do with it? I don't actually have a strap on this, so, so that you use that the pack mount like you showed. Yeah, yeah, I do have a. I don't have it on this camera, but I have a uh, a wrist strap that's also from Peak Design, so um, I can put my my uh, my hand through that. So if for some reason I I get distracted and I drop it or something, it's not gonna actually fall. It'll just hang on my wrist. I, I've always liked top loaders, but I think like for a smaller size camera, like this, that size or like your A6000, uh, um, uh, Cronel, I think those, those, those clips work really well. I'm not saying they don't work for bigger cameras, but I find that like, you know, especially backpacking when you're, you know, you can slip, you can fall, you're going through brush, you're going through whatever. If you have like a larger, heavier camera, which is mine are, and it's not the camera so much as it's the lenses. You know, the lenses, you know, one thing, they've made all the camera bodies all so much smaller, but the higher end lenses, like the ones I use, are actually quite large and actually very heavy and no lighter and sometimes even heavier than like the ones that we're used to use on the, on the DSLRs. So I, I kind of like to have a top loader, um, you know, which is basically a, uh, you know, it has like, the, you zip on the back and then the camera goes in. So it's usually, if you can figure out different ways to rig it to your pack. Um, the only thing I always say is, is, is try to figure out a way to have a leash. You know what I mean? Like have a carabiner and whatever attached to that case. So when, like you take your hip belt off or whoever, it doesn't, doesn't go down. It just happened to me. So. <laughs> hey, Jason, uh, yeah, if you get, just, if that's you, what I look for. If you yeah. get a chance, Jason, uh, Pull out your latest lens purchase and, and show everybody oh, yeah. you know, like yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm gonna get lens. Yeah, this won't go out. backpacking with me unless I know I'm I'm shooting like wildlife, but you know. Hey Dave. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> I did get a cool cool shot of the moon with it last night or two nights ago though, full moon. So <laughs> Nice. But yeah, this is too big for me to take backpacking. This is more like wildlife and more easily attainable wildlife. Or if I, I do canoeing trips and stuff like that, where where there's a lot of like up in the Arctic and there's a lot of good wildlife up there, so I won't have to carry it on my shoulders. But it's this one is too big and heavy to realistically take backpacking. How much? How much does <laughs> that weigh approximately? It's about five pounds. Oh god. Wow. Yeah. Jason, do you? Do you do you have a top loader um, case brand that you prefer or have had that you like? I've always gone with uh, Low Alpine um, or Alpine Pro. What is it? It's you know you know Al the, the the regular backpacking brand Al uh, Alpine Low. Okay, L O W E, right? Yeah, yeah. They have yeah. a um, they have a brand. It's like the all weather brand, and it has. Uh, let me let me grab it. I have one handy. Uh, low pro okay and this is a bit they make all sizes this is obviously a larger one for a bigger camera with the bigger lens but you can kind of see the camera goes in like that um you know you can also like now they have bags they actually there's a couple companies making pretty good smaller size hybrid bags that you can use you could actually take backpacking on shorter trips um you know if you wanted to and they're kind of designed with the camera bag built in 
see the yeah. The nice thing with top loaders is, is if you have them like on your waist or on your front, you can it's it's a really quick yeah. you know, it's quick to get it out. Kind of similar to having the clip. It's there and it's in front of you, and if you mount it separately, it makes it a little easier. But you know, whip it out. Control, uh, the general gist is. So like you can kind of see, this is kind of my main one and my, my zoom lens, it's still massive. <laughs> but you basically, you know, go in, you load it in like that on the top and then, you know, this there's a loop here for your hip belt. And then again, I always kind of, you can kind of see, I still have a carabiner on there and I'll carabiner it to another strap in case, you know, I get really tired, which happens when you backpack, as you know, and you kind of forget that it's on your waist belt. You let your waist belt go and your camera goes down. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> These also have uh, low pros and a lot of the other brands too, they have, it comes with it built in. They have like this, this is like a rain. So this will come out, you can close the bag still and then you put it over and it's like an extra, extra rain or wet water protection. So, so they're pretty good. Any other uh, gear questions or gear tips that people want to share? All right, let's so let's talk a little bit about technique. I'm, I'm gonna, I, you know, again, I'm an ad, admittedly um, sort of an intermediate level uh, um, photographer. So I'll share sort of the two basic tips that I try to follow or you know, the, the rules. You know, one, uh, the best photos I've gotten are at golden hour, which is like just before sunrise or just after sunrise. And so if you know that you're gonna to try to get a particular shot of a particular location, you wanna to try to um, you know, look at the weather, you need to look at the time and when sunrise and sunset is and a plan around that. Um, obviously, if you're backpacking or doing a day hike, a long day hike, you can't necessarily plan you know, every shot that way because you know, you're not gonna only be hiking at golden hour. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the best shots I've gotten have been during those times. The second one is the rule of thirds. And there's, you can Google it, you know, you'll find a Wikipedia page that has some good examples of like photos taken without using, you know, crop using the rule of thirds and, and with, and uh, basically it's just a way of framing your subject so that they're not, like we are all here on Zoom are kind of like front and center. Normally, you're going to be like, you know, one third over, you know, or at or one third up or down. And so that's the similar thing when you're composing your shot is you want to look at that the horizon lines, not cutting, you know, bisecting your uh, your photo right across the middle. Uh, but it's a, you know, one third from the top or one third from the bottom, depending on what your your subject is. Um, and then similarly, if there are people in that, you know, you, you're going to be, you know, one third from one side or the other, but not right in the middle, generally speaking. And um, uh, you, that just makes a more interesting photo. I can't tell you, I can't tell you the, the reasoning for why that is, um, you know, that's what makes me intermediate. <laughs> but um, I can tell you that it works. And uh, maybe Jason can talk a little bit more about that or, or one of you if you have some insight into that. It, it actually goes, way way back and comes from painting the rule of thirds and that idea go. of competition yeah. so so it's you know um yeah it's very old it's very old philosophy there's another one and ansel adams has i believe an essay on it and whatever called like the the golden golden mean and it's kind of like a a curve thing um but there there's a lot of basic composition stuff um out there you know leading lines like like a lot of times like if you have something that kind of leads your eye into a direction or framing. So you have a waterfall and there's a tree in front of you. You use the branches of the tree to kind of frame the waterfall. Things, basically the whole concept of most of it is sort of directing your eye to whatever you want the main focus of your, your picture to be. Um, and yeah, and, for, and the rule of thirds definitely applies for, for whatever reason. Like most of you, if you look at how you're framed in this, your eyes are on what, what would be the top third, right? And like when they teach you cinematography, when you take in the portraiture and stuff, they tell you they want to put the eyes on the third. So if you break the image down sort of horizontally into thirds, you want, generally the idea is to put the eyes on that top third. 
So, so yeah. And then they also have, you know, obviously the vertical thirds as well. So rather than center punching with one, you know, right or left, you know, the, I, I think there's a, there, you could probably find it on YouTube. When I first took my first photography class in eighth grade and I remember they had a, a this Kodak video that was already ancient, but it was funny and they talk about it. And the, the picture and I, is a seagull and they, they talk about how, what's more interesting? Is it, you know, the seagull in the middle where you just look at the seagull or you have the seagull on the left and it's like, well, where did it come from, right? Or you put it on the right and you're like, well, where is it going, you know? So that's maybe the easiest way to do it. Um, a lot of it is just take a lot of pictures. I mean, that's kind of the best way to get good at composition. Take a lot of pictures, you know, try to evaluate them when you're done. You're like, huh, it would have been more interesting had I done that, or it would have been more interesting if I didn't do that, you know? I mean, that's, that's probably the best way to get better at composition and learn about composition, you know? Yeah, and when you see the ones, you know, when you're looking at a series of three or four pictures of a same, the same subject and you're like, this is the one that I really like, think about why do you like that? You know, what about it is attractive to you? And you'll begin to be able to recreate that you know, effect, you know, with other, with other photos. One of the things that I, other things that I do is I like to, when I'm doing outdoor photography, oftentimes I try to use people in the photos to provide a sense of scale because sometimes you're looking at things that are just so immense and so amazing and huge that without some point of reference, you don't really get a sense, you know, in the, in the, in the little picture that you are taking, you know, what you're looking at and how, how grand it really is without being there. But if you can get some people that are in there somehow, maybe they're, and I, I try to usually, they're not usually posed. They're not just standing there going, you know, smiling at you, but you know, they're hiking or they're hiking away or whatever, or they're hiking towards you. That's fine too. Or they're, or it's a, a side shot, but um, it gives you a sense of scale. And I think that's been really useful for me. I, I really enjoy those, uh, those kinds of photos. Other tips I, or I questions? Yeah, I what? experiment with framing and then I find that I like what well, I like this about this photo and that about that photo and trying to eliminate ends up being hard. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's also one of the challenges of like living in a digital world versus a film world. Because, you know, back in the days when, when I was shooting film, you know, like the first time I did the John Muir Trail in 1980, I carried a 35 millimeter single lens reflex film camera and roll, you know, canisters of 35 millimeter film. And I had to be, I had to be stingy with every photo I took, you know, I had to like, do I really want to take this photo? Cause I only have, you know, 12 photos left on this roll, you know, and I only have three rolls left for the rest of the trip, you know, or whatever. And, uh, you know, so you have to think, you know, ah, it's not that important. Or, you know, oh, it's not that special, or the lighting's not that great, or whatever. And now you can take pictures and it doesn't really cost you anything. You know, you just take pictures. And then it's just a matter of deciding what to do, you know, which to keep and share and edit or do something with. Let's see. Uh, anybody else want to share what they're using or any tips or tools? for composing outdoor photos or questions? I guess I would be curious if anyone has any good stories of like trying to compose a photo or get a really unique angle, especially in the outdoors. And like, I, I know I've like been taking a video or doing something like while crossing a stream or trying to get a certain perspective that's maybe more challenging. I would be curious if anyone has tried that or something like, you know, really crazy hike or climb that they did to get get a cool photo. Oh, that's a great question, Allison. I'll tell you one thing that I've done that I've had a people, couple of people ask me about. With, I've done it with my iPhone. And there is a live, there's something called live photo on the iPhone, which takes like a, a burst of photos. And it's like a little mini video in a way. Um, but when you're in the, when you take a live photo and then you go to your, um, you go to your, your album view, the photo albums, and you, you click on that live photo and then you swipe up, it gives you an option to change that into like a motion blur. And so I've done that where I've been over like a stream or at a um, something like that. 
And if you have a tripod, even better, you can use that live photo mode on the iPhone, and there's probably something similar on Android, to take that and then edit it as a basically motion blur. So you get that nice blurry water effect, you know, of the, of the motion of the waterfall or the cascade. And that's been kind of fun. Um, not really the story that you were looking for, but, uh, uh, you know, just yeah, a little. Yeah, for cheap. sure. Well, it's always fun to get animal pictures and try to get them before the animals leave. <laughs> or, or they're just kind of, you get lucky sometimes that they're just kind of standing there. It's like bison and Catalina, or sometimes a marmot will just stand there. Maybe, you know, it just depends. Um, there was one time we were doing San Jacinto and we were hiking and my friend, there was like a huge group like in front of us she needed to go to the bathroom <laughs> and she couldn't go because the group would keep like, you know, all the people would keep going and finally she got a break from it. And then she went into the bathroom to use the woods. And then all of a sudden she saw some deer <laughs> staring at her and things like that. So, you know, with the animals, you never know when they're going to come out and where they're going to be. And did she get a photo of it? <laughs> I got a photo of it, but, <laughs> but it, but it was after like she went to the bathroom and everything. So, <laughs> you don't take those pictures, Jeff. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you threatened to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that hey. happened with my friend in Mammoth. She she went, she was going to the bathroom and a, a bear like came out behind the tree. Um, and so I have a picture of her kind of standing there, not going to the bathroom, but you know, looking at the bear and then the bear kind of coming out behind the tree. It was pretty cool. Um, wow. It was just a campground, but it, it was neat. So the awesome. moral of the story is always take your phone when you're going to the bathroom? Yeah, you never know what wildlife may jump out at you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's snake season up in my area. So at least a couple hikes I've been now, I've seen like a full-on rattler, all different sizes. They just pop out of nowhere. And we were taking, we were walking by and then the rattler was like, like hooked onto a branch. And then, so we just kind of stood there and started talking and all of a sudden like the, Snake didn't like that we were talking next to it, and all of a sudden just hissed at us like, shh, and he ran up the hill. <laughs> oh, yeah. Picture first before we what, ran up the hill. <laughs> which, which brings up a great question. What's the most unusual wildlife that you've captured on, on, in a photo? I know, Jeff, you probably, I have some pretty cool shots. I, I was up in the Arctic a couple of years ago, and I got some pretty cool shots of like wolves and musk oxen, um, both of which are pretty cool. <laughs> and pretty, pretty can, unusual, you know, we don't see I, those down here. No, I'll, I'll send you the one wolf, one of the wolf pics I got, Jeff, and you can post it. If I send it to you, you can post it, right? Is that, yeah, sure. That, I'll, I'll send that over, so that's kind of neat. But um, the interesting thing was we were really far north and uh, the shot I took, you'll see, it looks like broad daylight, but it was, and it basically was, but it was three in the morning when I actually took the shot. Um, but, you know, 24 hours of daylight up there, the sun never went down the whole time I was, the whole time I was up there. Um, and uh, one of my, one of my friends I was on a trip with just yelled at me to get out of my tent. Um, he's like, grab your camera. And I got out and, and, and the wolf that you will see in a minute was, was literally like right out, um, just right outside. Um, um, like right outside of my tent. And apparently he had just peed on my tent. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, uh, let's see, how am I gonna, I'm gonna email it to you, Jeff. But uh, yeah, and yeah, so I got, it's pretty cool. I got this shot. I had a long lens, you know, not the one I have now, but I had a, another lens that was um, uh, before that, which was uh, around the same size, telephoto wise, just a, a different, a different brand. Um, but I got this shot of a, um, an Arctic wolf. So let's see. Um, if you look really close at the shot, if you punch in on it, you can see mosquitoes flying around it. And the cousins of those mosquitoes all landed on my legs, about a hundred of them. <laughs> so I pay, I pay that. There's usually a really the high price to pay for really great shots. And my price for this one was about, about 50 mosquito bites on my legs. So uh, yeah, but 
I, I'm just downloading it right now. So hang on cool. a second. Uh, so for while well, we're waiting for this photo here, um, one of the one of the probably most interesting wildlife encounters I captured on film was a bobcat, which you know that's not really a you know very rare or very dangerous or anything like that, but it was in San Clemente, and so you know I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it was in South Orange County, and you know I caught a bobcat and. It was it kind of, it was walking away from us. We were at the trailhead and it was walking away and it was, it looked back over its shoulder. It stopped, looked back over its shoulder just as I captured the photo. And then it just kind of wandered off. It was like, yeah, whatever, you know. So I've shared Arctic Wolf One in the chat. So you should be able to open that and check that out. That's, that's pretty darn cool. That's beautiful. I had a question for Jason, actually. Yeah. So when we're like outdoors hiking and stuff, um, when I want to change, I know when, when I change my lens, it's, it's like dirt dusty outside. So I recently found that there's a spot whenever I uh, take a photo and I was wondering like if you had any advice on first how to get rid of it and second how to maybe avoid that when you're out on trails. Sure. Are you using Lightroom or any like post processing? Lightroom. Yeah. So it's super easy to get rid of dust spots in Lightroom. There's a little tool. It kind of looks like the almost like the print symbol or it's like a little circle with the thing. And all you need to do is you, you click on that and you go to that mode and you just put it over the dust spot and click on it. And you, about nine times out of 10, that dust spot will disappear. What it does is it takes, it searches for the most similar looking stuff around it, copies it, and then covers it up. So that's not uncommon. So basically that's what happens is you have dust on your sensor. I'll show you the, 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 the easiest tool for that is a uh, rocket blower. Uh, I should have one in here, let's see. Uh, Great question, Krunal. I have to do the same thing. I, I mean, I don't have any dust spots yet, but I want to, I had the same question. <laughs> yeah, let's see. I just need to dig through my messy camera bag here to dig out a rocket blower. Uh, should have one in there, but I'm not seeing it. Hold on. It's basically kind of like a, um, a big, uh, well, rocket. <laughs> Let's see, in there. Yeah, here we go. So it's, it kind of looks like this. And it's, this is air. So it, 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 you basically are, are pushing air out of the camera. So it's basically what you want to do. Every time I change a lens, and um, I'll do the two things. I'll do both the, uh, especially with mirrorless, this is actually less of a problem with DSLRs, one of the benefits to those. Let's say you're, you, you take your lens off. I always do two things if I, with the new lens. I'll go in and, you know, this is where the lens and where the dust would, would accumulate on the lens. So I clean that out. And then I, uh, I'll go in and I'll face down and, hit, and just blow the sensor. If you know where the dust is, a lot of times you can kind of do that as well. Um, they do also have like sensor cleaning kits that are like little, it's almost like a little, looks like a gummy, like a Q-tip with a gummy bear at the end of it. And you can go in and like just pluck the dust off. If it's really bad, there's like other cleaning solutions. So um, if it's really bad, yeah, you would look at that. But, but usually more, most of the time you can get rid of it with just, with, with just one of these. Sometimes it takes a little work though. You gotta give it, you know, you gotta keep checking. But very easy to get rid of in post, you know. Um, again, most, like it's funny, I, 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 a friend of mine gifted me masterclass and, and I was watching the Jimmy Chin one and you, he was showing his raw photographs and there were dust things like all over it. So, so don't worry about it. It's like all of us, it's just a common thing and they're very easy to fix in post. So, um, but the best way to avoid it is, is, is these. 
So uh, speaking of post, you know, how many of you are editing your photos after the fact? A show of hands. And what are you using to edit your photos? Kernal, you're using Lightroom, right? Uh, who else raised their hand? I mean, we'll, um, Shauna, what are you using? Well, since I just do the iPhone, I just use the iPhone edit. Okay, yeah. Sometimes when I put it put on Instagram, if I do it that way too, it just depends on the picture um, and how it edits on the phone. But the editing on uh, both those are pretty good. I do a lot of editing on my iPhone directly as well. Yeah, it's, you know, if I'm just going to post it on Facebook or Instagram, that that usually does the the job. When you're doing editing on the iPhone, are you using just like their preset filters and things like that, or is there actually a way to get more in depth yeah. to sort of tune it up? Because that's yeah, something I notice. My pictures are always really flat and kind of washed out looking. Yeah. Because well, you, you, you can click on the when you go into the edit, there's like each little brightness and stuff, and then you click on it and you can increase it or decrease it. Yeah, you get all these these settings across the mm -hmm. bottom. And you can control saturation and brightness and shadows and bright, you know, uh, highlights and um, the color warmth and a lot of those things. So, if what? you want, there's also a ton of apps that yeah. iPhone app design. I actually use the Photoshop app. Um, oh, you do? Yeah, I use the Photoshop app, and a lot of times I'll do my pictures like you know I do them on my iMac with my big fancy screen, and you know it looks amazing. But then I always like to re-edit them on the phone or look at them on the phone and see if I want to punch them up. Because you can get away with a lot more on a phone than you can on a big monitor. That's right. kind of the funny truth, because if it's this big, you can get away with a lot. You can push a lot more of the saturation, a lot more of the contrast and stuff. So, so what, is the, like what is the deciding factor? You know, like whether you use your computer or your phone, is it going to be, is it like the final destination of how you're sharing the photo? Kind of, yeah. So, so I mean, all my initial processing is Lightroom. Um, sometimes there's a few things I'll do in Photoshop because you can't really do them in Lightroom that are like, but I, it's kind of rare. There's a few like sort of like things called like focus stacking and things like that where you're compositing multiple images. So like focus stacking would be say you want to get, you have like a lake and you have a whole bunch of like something in the foreground and you have stuff way far away and a great sky. Very few cameras can get everything across from from front to back and focus so you shoot front middle back you focus you shoot three shots for those different focal lengths so if i do that i go into photoshop and i blend the three exposure you know the three different focus things for that um but mostly mostly at lightroom most of my stuff is lightroom and i do that first and then when i you know i put them in dropbox to get, you know, for my phone, I'll download them in, and then I look at them on the phone. Always make sure to have your brightness turned all the way up. Turn my brightness all the way up and look at it, and and I see if it, how it looks on the phone, and if I can do push it further than I can, you know, on the monitor or for print. I, you know, on the phone, I'll do it. I'll do little tweaks just to make it look good on that format, you know. And then the digital formats for like computer looks different, and then the prints look completely different. It's it's kind of a it's it's kind of hard actually. It's a lot of work to try to get photos to look the same across different platforms so i found out something kind of interesting about um iphone apparently they i guess they came up with a photo processing program which wasn't selling so they dumped all of that technology into like the ipad and the iphones they, they used to i used it the initial they had one called aperture which was like their pro editing their version of Lightroom. And I started out using that. I was a little upset because I spent like $200 on it and a year later they discontinued it. No, so apparently they last Apple it. product, I, software product I buy. But yeah, well, um, apparently they dumped it into, you know, the iPhone. Yeah, some of it. It's not the same yeah. though. Yeah, and not quite as Some well of those featured. features they did, but the iPhone, it's, it's very good. It's not that it's bad. I mean, you're basically doing the same things that you do in Lightroom. You have less ability to sort of, you know, well, one, you're looking at it here. So looking at it on a smaller screen is never going to be as good as looking at it, a larger picture of the image. You know, um, you can only zoom in so far on the phone, whereas you can zoom in pretty tight, you know, on, on a bigger screen. And there's just more tools. 
just way more tools than like a Lightroom or whatever. But there's nothing wrong. I mean, the phone editing stuff is good. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do, and even just in the regular, yeah, in the regular Photos app has like the main most of the main stuff you'd use. It's just a little harder. Like if say you wanna, you know, you you have a super dark, you know, foreground and a really, you know bright sky or whatever and you want to try to get them all blended that's that's that kind of stuff is quite hard to do on the phone that's generally you would need to i'm sure there are programs that do it but you know anytime so, you're trying to really push images you're going to want to do them on the computer or ipad ipad's pretty good ipad pro jeff can i ask if you ever use like any of the like the peak finder apps or like ones where you see the location where you're at in the picture yeah any other one besides peak finder uh, uh, photo pills um starry night i think is one there's a bunch photo pills i've used a bunch of times that's mostly for astrophotography though but it'll tell you it's pretty cool it tells you where the moon's going to be at what time or where the milky way is going to be at what time like in your location so that's that's kind of neat yeah i use peak finder when i'm looking for the the names of the peaks that's kind of useful and you can even do the thing that i just learned recently in fact is that you can take a photo if it's geotagged and load it into Peak Finder after the fact and it will it'll label everything. So you don't have to use Peak Finder while you're at the you know on the trail or at the peak or whatever because sometimes you don't have data and you don't have all the you know you don't have all of the the uh, data downloaded to do it anyways, but when you get back home, you can as long as it's geotagged, you can uh, load it up into Peak Finder and it'll it'll tell you what those things are. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, also, I just like it because it tells me where the peak is. <laughs> so yeah. Right. Right. And what <laughs> how the far I am are, from it? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you're looking, and even if you have a map, you know, uh, the map might not label all of these sort of you know little tiny you know peaks. They're, they're sort of incidental. You might just label the the major ones. So it's kind of neat to be able to see that. Um. So one of the tools that I used to use. Uh, I'm using Lightroom now to catalog my photos, and that's sort of part of the work process. Um, uh, before that, I was using Apple Photos, which is like their free one that comes with the, you know, the Mac OS, and it worked okay. Um, but uh, I'm I'm pretty happy with Lightroom. Um, but the, I guess the quite one of the questions I had was, how many of you have photos or or religiously transfer photos from your device, whether it's a iPhone or a GoPro or a mirrorless camera to your computer and have some kind of a master category or library of those. So Grinald does, Greg does, awesome, Shauna, awesome, Nina, Dave. So what are you guys using? If, if you're, uh, I know some of us are using Lightroom. What are you, the rest of you using? OneDrive. What was that? OneDrive, OneDrive. <clears throat> Google Drive, the whole. Or Google, is it. that Google Photos or Google Drive? Both. You can use both. Okay. Yeah. yeah I think I use all three. <laughs> Seriously, I, do I mean, like, like for backup redundancy or. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Well, one, one for work, so I have it for work anyhow. So I'm like, I'm just gonna double my photos. It doesn't matter, so it's in two places. Yeah, it doesn't hurt, right? Right. Yeah. And and when you share photos, where do you where do you share your photos? Yeah, uh, you know, are you using Instagram, Facebook? I I have I, I have to admit that like I have still have a a Flickr account that I occasionally post to, from way back when. Um, so. Do you have a, a place that you like to share your photos or, and do you, are you selective about what you share? Just Instagram, Jeff. And it's, cause that's where I log my hikes too. So I know what number I'm on and what peak I'm on and all those good all stuff. Right. The top 10 pictures, Jeff, that's what makes it on there. <laughs> the top 10 pictures. <laughs> top 10 pictures for a hike or a trip. Yeah. You know, with the peak, uh, if it's peak, so like I have the peak with the, the patch somehow, and then like just pictures of the trail, and then summit photos, you know, good ones. Cool. 
Yeah, I, I, have, I have a question. How many people are using iPhone versus Android? Who, who uses iPhone? Okay, most everybody. Well, yeah, fair number. The one thing that's keeping me to the droid is I can talk to the phone and tell it focus and shoot. It's focus capture. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's actually capture, shoot, or smile. <laughs> and so I've been funny. told that should be my trail name. <laughs> it, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so you, there are uh, ways to do that with an that. iPhone as well. There's like a shortcut. You know, they have these uh, shortcut commands you can use for with Siri to do things like that. So it is possible. I don't do that myself. I, you know, I'm old school, I guess. I like to click. And, or you know, I find it to be really convenient because you don't have to like you can actually shoot one-handed and you don't won't move it trying to touch you know touch the screen to take the picture. All right. I get mad when my regular camera doesn't do that. <laughs> George, you were gonna say say something, I think. Well, I kind of had a question because I use the iPhone Pro to take pictures. Uh, yeah. Last week I was at Mount Wilson, and I was at the top. I took a I took a picture of the city, and the city looked clear. But when I took the picture, there was this haze, and I had to download that picture and use Photoshop to remove that haze. So I'm just wondering, is, was there? I was going to ask, is there like a tip you have that I can remove that haze from my iPhone where I could have just share that photo a lot quicker rather than downloading to my computer remove that haze um you know they make like the little clip-on filters and whatnot you a polarizer you'd want a polarizer filter that that's about the, that would be the only way to really do it you know on an iphone you got now four three four lenses now on the iphone pro yeah so. i know well I, i'm assuming someone makes some kind of thing yeah. for it i don't know but i, I, I would assume they would I was wondering if there was some kind of app, you know, because there's some kind of apps that do that, but they don't work so great. But because I use it on my drone, um, you know, I fly it up, and I have filters that I can put on it. George, you might want to use the live feature on the phone that's available. Sometimes that will. Okay. A quick yeah, I mean, the other thing is, like, for me, I would bring it into Lightroom and use dehaze, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And that does a pretty pretty good job. Well, quick and dirty way to do a polarizer: if you have polarizing sunglasses, put your sunglasses in front of the lens. Well, good tip. Another thing, I, I didn't, I don't have one of these for my the, the current incarnation of iPhone that I have. But um, have you ever seen or played around with an Allo clip? Uh, which is, you know, we talk about clip-on filters, but these are the clip-on lenses for... And they... I was literally just about to ask that. Has anybody ever used one of these? Because I've come so close to getting something. Like, there's some things that look really cool. Like, wow, that works. That's amazing. So I want to hear about this thing. Yeah, so uh, I've used the Allo Clip, um, mainly the macro lens. So they do have like a wide angle and a fisheye lens. And I think they might even have like a form of telephoto lens that, you know, adds a couple levels of magnification. Um, I haven't used those, um, but I have used, I, well, I, I should, I, let me backtrack. I have used the fisheye. I have used, um, I haven't really used the wide angle and I, but I have used the macro. I think that's the most interesting to me. So like if you're yeah. in nature yeah. and you're looking at a, lichen on a rock or something yeah. you put that little macro lens on there you can get right in there and you see so much information so much detail that um you wouldn't notice otherwise and it's it can be really really fascinating if you're into sort of you know the naturalist point of view yeah um, so the thing works well it sounds like it works pretty well yeah okay yeah um again that's one of those things where um if they're like I've used it to try to take pictures of of the of the, uh, the the discrete elements of a flower blossom, but if there's a little bit of wind, forget it. You know, it's like everything has to be kind of pretty still to be able to capture it well. And um, 
uh, yeah, wind just, just plays havoc with that. Any other questions or tips? There's something in the notes, um, loop deck. Anyone use a loop deck? What is that? Ron posted in the chat. That. Ron, hey, Ron. What's loop deck? Illuminate us. If he's there, I don't know. He's on mute right now. So there Hello? we go. Hey, Ron. Hey. Um, loop deck is a keyboard that plugs your computer and it hooks up with like Lightroom. And it's got like a bunch of knobs and sliders all over it, like a mixing board. And you can adjust um, like different aspects of the editing program with different knobs. So instead of like going to the program and clicking and moving your sliders or whatever, you just do it on the keyboard. So it's like, like it's real time. Oh, that's cool. Do you have one of these? I don't. I want to get one. They're somewhere around two or $300. Uh -huh. But I, I don't know if I'd use it enough or, you know, if, if people are happy with them or I, I don't think it's really popular. It's probably used more for like, you know, people that do it as a job, as a profession. Yeah. I think if you're like a pro retoucher or you're doing it like eight, nine, 10 hours a day, that's something you'd use. If you're not doing it that often, you know, uh, usually like I've had not, not for that, but I've had editing. I work as an editor as well. I've had edit a lot of, I've had editor things in the past, but I eventually they, they become more trouble than they're worth, you know? Like, oh, hey, the new version of Lightroom just came out. You download it, and oh, hey, it doesn't work with the, <laughs> with the loop deck, you know? Then you gotta wait for the version of that. So I don't know, I, I do feel they're a little, probably a little more trouble than they're worth, they're neat. And I mean, if you're gonna be doing the volume of, of that, it's great, but you know, um, I, I, you know, I think that's, uh, yeah. I don't know, you could probably find something more useful to spend $300 on. So it sounds it's, like it's it's kind of almost app specific or program specific then. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, oftentimes it, you can you can buy one and it'll work on other apps, so you can use it for for several different things and just program the buttons on it if that makes sense. So say you're using Photoshop, Premiere, Avid, and and you know DaVinci Resolve, you can a lot of them will work across all those platforms, and you can program the buttons to work specifically with not all of them, some, most of them do that. So you can use them on different apps, but you know. I was just thinking it would allow you to really uh, hone in and fine tune your pictures to the nth degree. Yeah. I, I don't know that, I don't know that, I mean, maybe, maybe I think everyone's a little different in how they approach things. Maybe, maybe the way you do it or the way you like to do it, that if that works, makes it a more enjoyable process for you, then I, then I think it's worth it. You know, it's a way you really want to try it and make it work, that's great. Um, you know, I don't know how much, it, like, just objectively would it, it would improve it, right? It's maybe more if, like, that's how your methodology or how you work or how you feel, like, the tactile process of doing it would make it better. But I don't think the actual, you know, piece of gear itself would improve it, you know, like, uh, in any right. you know, you other way. You should be able to have the same thing with sliders and your mouse and, you know, entering values as you can with, with those those machines. Yeah, yeah. You should be able to have the same granular control yeah the the interface as it is as through one uh, you know something like the loop deck but um you know one one thing would be to find somebody who's got one that you can borrow and play around with or if you can buy one with a return policy that lets you you know try it and then if it doesn't work out you know it doesn't really improve anything return it yeah learn you know honestly you can learn keyboard shortcuts too um uh, you can kind of see they a lot of them make overlays. This is my editing overlay, so they'll they'll make these kind of like overlays, and it has all the the shortcuts for different programs. This is an editing one for Premiere, but I have an Avid one. I have you know, uh, I know they make them for a lot of different programs, but uh, um, that's one another thing you could do, and that's like twenty dollars. You can wash it in the dishwasher or whatever. So that might be another <laughs> cheaper way to do it, where you have all the keys and the different functions, you know on the on the actual keyboard pictures might make it a little more easy as well and maybe a cheaper way oh and ron's pasted a link to one of these uh loop decks so if you're curious you can check it out um i was just suggesting before you take off if you could in the chat share a link to your instagram account so we can all follow each other um and or, and or whatever wherever you happen to share your photos and we'll we'll do that 
And I'm gonna, um, I'll post a recording. <clears throat> I'll post a recording of this and I'll put in some notes in there so that if we've got, um, where we've talked about a particular product or something like that, I'll try to put a link to that in there. So uh, you can go back and find that, like, <clears throat> gosh, the peak design clip for the backpack, you know, um, straps to carry a camera or the, uh, the quad lock case and the different mounts like the ones that I use. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, we'll, we'll have that available. Jeff? And uh, I see Instagram accounts popping up there. All right. Jeff, hey, Jeff. can I just, oh, sorry. Sorry, Ron, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask, ask Jason a question before we leave, but sure. go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. Okay, uh, Jason, I don't have the 6500, but I have the 6300, and I was wondering what your favorite lens to use on it. I was thinking of going with the 1655, but it's a little expensive. Second in line is what, like the 18105? Or I mean, um, did you did you experiment with a lot of different lenses on yours? One thing, like I always like, I was already shooting the full frame ones before I got the 6500. So all my lenses were already the full frame models, which are way more expensive. Um, I'll tell you what, there's some of the aftermarket ones that have come out are really great. Uh, Tamron has a couple really good ones that they've just released for the Sony E-mount. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's cheap, but they're way cheaper than the Sony ones. They have a, um, I think it's 28 to 70 uh, F2.8, which is really great. If you want to go wider, I think they have a, um, I forget the exact, their numbers are different from the standard. Normally it's like 16 to 35, 24 to 70, 24 to 105. Those are like the full frame ones. And you know, the A65 is a APS sense, a smaller sensor, but the full frame ones will work on it. Um, I would look at those Tamron ones and I kind of generally try to recommend, even though it's a little more expensive, you buy the full frame lenses just in case. Cause like if you buy the APC ones and then you get the full frame camera, you're like, oh crap, I have this lens. And you know, I just bought this full frame camera and I, I, you know, this AP, I can use the APS lens, but I'm not using the full, you know, functionality or the full sensor size of the, of the cameras. So you spend a little bit more at the time, but, you know, that lens will last you for, for way longer. Yeah, um, so you just forego the autofocus. Oh, no, it'll autofocus. It'll work. It'll work great. On those, those were, it's a Sony E-mount, so it'll work. It'll work. I mean, not probably not as good as the high-end Sony ones, but it'll probably work as good as, like, the average, the regular Sony ones. Um, as long as it's not adapted, where you run into the autofocus issues is if you're using something that's um, adapted. So like a Canon lens with an adapter onto a Sony camera or onto a Nikon camera or a Nikon lens adapted onto a Sony camera. That's where you kind of run into the, the autofocus issues. Um, yeah, so they have a 28 to 75. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, and usually the, I mean, you'll see these cameras, like I'm looking at one and it's like 18 to 200. You know, the, 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 with lenses, like the whole saying, like, you know, you know, jack of all trades, master of none kind of makes a lot of sense. If you see something that's like 18 to 300, it's not going to be really good anywhere throughout that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the smaller the range of the zoom, generally the better the lens quality of the lens is. Or even go and buy primes. You can buy some pretty reasonably priced primes now. You know, if you're going to spend $1,500 on a zoom lens, you can buy three primes kind of in three different levels of that lens, achieve the same thing and actually get like a higher image quality. So that's one yeah. way to do it. Well, yeah, I would, I would, what's that? A prime lens would be a lens that's like one focal length. So rather than like a 24 millimeter to 70 millimeter, it's just 24 millimeters or just 50 millimeters or just 35 millimeters. So it's, it's locked in. You can't zoom in or zoom out. It's just one thing. But because it's just one focal length, the image quality is almost always better. Like a cheap prime lens is better than almost any, except for the really pricey zooms, better, probably better at it, you know, at that focal range than, than a zoom lens will be. And they're cheaper, so that, that helps. <laughs> I know. agree with you. Uh, I bought a Tamron uh, 300 millimeter lens. Yeah. And it's amazing that the speed, the autofocus is quicker than my Nikon. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, they're, and Sigma as well. Um, Sigma has these really nice art lenses. The only thing is they're kind of, they're a little bulkier and heavier than the Tamron's. So like if you're putting like that lens, which is a little heavier and a little bulkier, or, or even the Sony lenses, the high-end Sony ones, 
you're putting those onto the smaller frame, it's a little bit of an imbalance. The Dameron ones are a little bit lighter and a little bit, you know, and, and still really nice. I'm trying to find that wider one, you know. And, and I mean, I mean, I, most of, like, I, I have a 24 to 70 and 18 are, is usually what, if I'm backpacking, those are the only two I bring. The 18 is a prime, it's Zeiss, it's a really expensive, nice lens for wide angle. But everything else is, you know, in that 24 to 70 covers most of what I use. And I may see an animal that I want to shoot, but, you know, most of, like, the Sierra, you're not going to see. You might see bears. You might see, it's not – but it's not consistent enough to really make it worth my while to carry, you know, to carry – where to go, you know, to carry this, you know, carry this thing, you know, this five pounds of, of lens. You know, it's not really worth it. And that's kind of what you need to really get, like, the better wildlife stuff. Um, yeah, they have, a, I think, 17 to 28, it looks like. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's a pretty good range. You know, you, you, know, you wouldn't really necessarily need more than that. You might, but, you know, I, I would look at these Tamrons. They're kind of a good deal, and they're a little bit lighter and a little bit more compact than the, uh, than, than the Sonys or the, or the Sigma ones. Sounds good. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to share something that uh, Jason, I kind of picked up from Jason on um, when we were in Zion National Park, uh, I don't know, four years ago, something like that. And um, we did a little day hike and, you know, I was taking pictures with probably my iPhone and, you know, uh, I think probably he was too. I think he had another camera, but um uh, one of the things that I noticed was that uh, Jason, you said something like, "You were you're, the way you were thinking was, I'm going to come back here at a certain time of year or a certain time of day because there's photos that I want to take, and this isn't the time. You know, it's not the right conditions." And so you were just making a mental note of like, you know, like, "Oh yeah, this would be a great shot," and uh, that was uh, kind of a new perspective for me because I would, I'm kind of like, oh, here I am, this is my chance, I'm gonna take a shot, you know, this is it. And, um, but if you really wanna get great photos, you have to consider sort of the weather, the clouds, the sunlight, the, the time of year, the time of day, all of those factors, and you have to plan for that. And, um, you know, there, so there's a little bit of a balancing act, you know, if, you know for me, it's more about the experience of the hike or the backpacking trip or whatever. And I'm very opportunistic about the photos that I take generally. But if you really wanna get some exceptional photos, it takes planning and preparation and thoughtfulness. And I saw that on that trip. And so I, I thank you for that, that little mm -hmm. advice, Jason. That was uh, a big tip that I don't think you know, knew that I picked no. up on, but uh, yeah. I really appreciated that. I, I will say, like, if you want to improve a lot of it, like, like I'll go, you know, say I go to a, a, a backpacking trip on the lake to the Sierra, right? I get there in the afternoon, I set up my tent, and usually what I'll do, knowing that I'm not going to shoot until magic hour, right, until like that, it's not even an hour, it's more like a half an hour usually, and sometimes the real magical light is like a minute, if that. But I go and I scout, right? I walk around the lake. And I, and I look for compositions. I look for things like what will make that like, say, a, a shot, like, you know, a good foreground, a good leading thing, a good, you know, and, and I set that up and mentally make a note of that. And then oftentimes, long before this, you know, maybe half hour, 45 minutes before I'm even ready to take the shot, I go there and I set up and I just hang out there and I kind of wait until the light comes or doesn't come. Sometimes it doesn't come. That happens, you know um photos a lot like fishing it's kind of a joke like you know sometimes the fish bite sometimes they don't like i've had a lot of trips where i, I went to norway you know and, and went to lofoten islands purely for photo and i spent a week and a half there and i got some nice shots but i never got like a real magical you know it's one of those places that's really high up in north of the arctic circle and it's you have these like three hour sunsets right because of the, the angle of the sun so it's famous for people just shooting sunsets for like three hours well, I never got that light, you know. I stayed with a friend for a couple of days. Two days after I left, he just sent me all these pictures saying, oh, you missed it by like two days, you know. So, but I mean, approaching, like looking at it and approaching it, and if you start getting more and more adept and better at processing your photos, you start thinking about, 
what you're going to do in post-processing before you shoot it. And that actually makes a difference. You know, like, well, I want this rock to be sharp. I want this to be sharp and that to be sharp. I can't get all that in my camera. So I'm going to shoot, you know, one shot close, one shot focus medium, one shot focus back. You do, I always shoot for my, my photos that I'm going to process. I always shoot exposure brackets. I mean, I don't always do focus stacking, but I always do. You probably remember this, Jeff. Yeah. Where bracketing. an exposure bracket, all, almost all good, like, cameras that have functionality other than your phone have exposure bracketing. So when I hit the, when I take a picture, it takes one photo that's three, three stops underexposed, one that's the exposure that I set it for, and then one that's overexposed. And then in post and Lightroom, and it's very easy to do this. It sounds hard, but it actually is really easy. You can merge those three photos and all of that information is in that photo. So all of the, the, the stuff that you wouldn't capture in that photo that's in like the shadows, you know, underneath the rocks or in the shade of the tree that you would lose with just an evenly exposed photo you have. So you can bring that up and it really affects your images. But yeah, like a lot of it is just looking and preparing and like looking around and trying to find interesting shots or interesting exposures, like thinking of composition and taking your time to try to set it up and to do that, you know, Sometimes just walk around before, I mean, maybe have your camera, but don't have it ready to shoot. Just walk around and look around and go, oh yeah, this is a really cool shot. And when the light gets really good, it's going to be worth shooting. And, and Jeff, you've seen, like, I don't, I often, I won't bring a good camera out if, if it's not good right. light. Because I know yeah, I'm not, not going to, I'm, I'm not going to spend time processing it. It's not worth it for me to shoot that. I might as well just use the iPhone. And I do. I shot way more shots. I mean, our Wonderland trip was amazing, but I didn't really get good light, right, Jeff? I mean, I didn't, we didn't really have great photo conditions, so I did what I could, and I got some nice shots, but I never had, like, super amazing sunset, you know, kind of glorious light. So I, I didn't really shoot much, you know. I, you know, I, I you, you try using other techniques and stuff, but, but most of the shots I got were of, of Jeff and Derek, you know, with the iPhone, you know. Got a reason so. to go back next May. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had a question. How many of you guys use, a, you know, a camera, a DSLR camera versus iPhone, or do you take both on a hiking trip? Because I'm old school. I'm always tempted to take my DSLR camera, but my hiking buddy always says, "No, why are you gonna carry extra weight? Just take your cell phone." So I'm just kind of curious. So. I've been kind of holding back on taking my camera and I just use my iPhone, but I found that I don't take the best pictures with the iPhone, even though I have the iPhone Pro. Yeah, so George, I'll go, I'll take that first. I mean, uh, I'll just use an example. Like this weekend, this last weekend, I did, uh, I'm up in Oregon right now, and I did um, one of the six, the Oregon six pack of peaks, Black Butte with my wife and our dogs and I just took my iPhone. I did not bring uh, my mirrorless. Um, but my intent, you know, firstly, the weather wasn't like, you know, great, you know, like there wasn't great clouds, you know, it was kind of gray. And, um, but secondly, that wasn't my intent. My intent wasn't to go there to get great photos. It was really just to do the hike and enjoy that. And so it depends on sort of what the purpose of it is for me. Um, the only time that I'll bring my mirrorless is if I specifically want to get something that I can't, I know that I won't do well with my iPhone. And, um, you know, like one of the things I'm jonesing to do, uh, we're, we're, we're supposed to go camping this weekend, but the campgrounds aren't open yet. But uh, one of these days, I'm going to try to get my hand at some night photography. And, you know, I know I can't do that really well with my iPhone, but I could with my mirrorless to a degree. And so I'd like to play with that and just see what I can do. And uh, then I'll definitely bring it for something like that. Why aren't you doing it with your iPhone, Jeff? Well, it doesn't handle the, the, the darkness as well. So um, it's not there's, gonna... There's lots of really good apps and they're not very expensive. I use Nightcap, it works great. Nightgap. Nightcap. Nightcap. But there's, there's, there's 20 of them. Yeah, that all do long exposure for iPhone. They're really good. Apply well, there you go. So I don't even have to bring my mirrorless next time. You know, they're just <laughs> I'll put it up on eBay. <laughs> yeah. There's also there's also Lightroom for iPhone. It's expensive, but you know, I mean, pretty much you can do anything with the iPhone if you're willing to pay for the apps. 
How do you use an app to take a photo or is it post, is it all post-processing? No, no the, app, the app just takes over the control of your camera. So you're not yeah. using your camera anymore. You're using the app. It's a, it's a camera app. Hmm. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. What some good night photography tips or anyone do star photography? Jason does. Yeah. Yeah. I do some, I, uh, I'm kind of opportunistic. I feel like I've had, that's a place I've not had the greatest luck in. Like I go and I set up like a perfect example. Jeff knows how hard day two of our hike was. I couldn't stand when we finished it, but I did get my ass out of bed at three in the morning and walk over to get a night <laughs> shot. And it's a nice shot, but you, it was hazy and you couldn't see any stars. So I feel like I've, I've tried to put myself in positions to get those and, and the weather or the atmospheric conditions don't tend to cooperate. Um, what I'd say with that is you really got to be, that's something where you, you, you work on the conditions time way more than you work on, than, as opposed to them working on your time, if that makes sense. Like you can go up to the Sierra and I think it's the highest hit rate of anywhere I've been. Seven nights out of 10, you're going to get a pretty sunset in the Sierra, at least, if not more. You know, you're going to get some, some level of really pretty light. It's just, I mean, it's kind of a magical place in that way. Like more than Glacier I spent a lot of time in. More than a lot of other places. I don't, it's just, it's great that way. But like, as far as getting good, clear skies for whatever reason, and I, I've struggled a little bit more. I know there are places like the desert's going to be your friend because it's more arid and dry. Um, and just as far as tips, like it depends on what you want. There are those apps and they, and they do have good results. But if you want to get like a higher level of more to work with and more to, you know, more to deal with, basically it's a fast lens. What you need is a good fast lens. Like again, like that, that 18 to 300 will not, will not give you a good result. And a prime is usually best. So even a cheap prime, like they have like Samyang and some of these other brands make these pretty fast, good wide angle lenses or, or even like mid wide angle, like a 30, 30, you know, 28 millimeter or 35 millimeter. Um, they're like F2.8 or F2. And for star photography, that's actually pretty good. But any kind of don't want to go much slower than F2.8 is the, the, the most open aperture for a lens to get star photography to do it really well. I mean, otherwise, again, you might as well just use an iPhone app if you're not going to do that. Tripod, obviously, because it's long exposure. 100% need a tripod. Um, the other good thing is like YouTube is your friend. I promise you whatever camera you have, if it's not a, even probably with the iPhone, someone has done some a star photography tutorial out there. So it's a great resource to go and watch and learn things. I still use it. Like there's things like I know that I know you can do that I, I haven't done before. I'll go and watch a YouTube tutorial. It's mostly post stuff, but it's like, oh yeah, I know I, I can do this. This is something you can do to fix this one problem. You know, I haven't dealt with it before. So I'll go and watch a tutorial and some, you know, sometimes you got to watch two or three before you find one you like, but YouTube's a great resource for, for learning and there's so much out there. I agree with you. Um, I have three prime lens, so I know what you're talking about. And that's the best way to go. It's a little, you know, cumbersome because you got to have three, you got to carry them with you. Yeah. But that's the best way to go. And uh, It's not, it's, it's a little bit more bulky, but I mean, you know, a lot of prime lenses are, aren't that big, you know, like, you know, like you can look at like, uh, if you look at my, my zoom and it's a good zoom, it's a pricey one. Um, but you know, this is the prime lens here. So, you know, it's about what, half the size of the zoom. Show that again. So like, this is the prime lens, right? It's about half the size and quite a bit lighter than the zoom. There's way less glass in this lens than there is in this lens. Like a zoom, zooms have a, are heavy and bulky and it's great because I have a, a wide range of things I can do. And this is a pricey one, so it's nice. It does a pretty good job throughout, but you know, you can get, this is way lighter. You can bring two of these and it's roughly the same weight and in a pack, if you pack it right, about the same bulk as, uh, as this, you know? So, and I always bring this, usually I bring this and then another prime I have, you know, so. I had a question, cause uh, I noticed with my 300 millimeter, I can, uh, I, it takes the best macro shots from far yeah. away. It blurs yeah. everything out and takes a nice picture of the focal point which I like, and it's a tamarind. So I use that one when I'm gonna like, you know, I wanna take a picture like a, I took a nice picture of a bee on a flower, 
and it wasn't too far away, but like it blurred everything out perfectly and it just yep. focused on the flower and the bee. Yeah, one good thing to just learn is, is learn your focal lengths and what they do and what the difference is. That's kind of like an, an easy entryway and just first thing to learn. Because lenses, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of, I'll be honest, there's not a lot of difference between cameras, right? Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, they're all pretty comparable. They're all really good. Like you can take great pictures with any of those cameras, you know, and even the iPhone, you know, where you really start noticing the difference is the lenses, you know. The lenses is where you really, really make a, a big leap. And when people ask me what to buy, a lot of times they're surprised because I'm like, I ask them their budget and say they have, they want to get started and they're reasonably serious. They have a $3,000 budget. I tell them buy a $2,000 lens and a $1,000 camera, you know, everyone wants the camera with all the fancy stuff in it. But the thing that's really going to improve your imagery is the lens. And that, that's where the iPhone, as good as they are, they, they can't compete with, you know, a good mirrorless camera or a good DSLR. That's where they really lose out with a good lens. Let me add that caveat with a decent lens, DSLR mirrorless camera, the, the, that's where the iPhones, I mean, you know, you look at the, I have the, I, and again, it takes good pictures, but look how tiny those are and they're plastic. It's just not, it's not the same. And also resolution, you know, um, some of these phones, I know the Android's like, you know, I don't know what yours is, but like, it's a hundred megapixel phone camera. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's used, it doesn't work, but you know, um, usually the resolution is, is the other big thing you can, you get with a, the, a, a camera camera and a full bigger sensor. Cool. I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Nina. Um, lens caps. I've seen a lens cap that stays on the camera and it like folds up and opens when the lens comes out. Has anyone used those? So you don't take it off. It actually just opens up as the lens comes out. Um, I've, I've seen cameras that have that functionality. I haven't really seen, um, like an actual lens cap like that. My, the, I don't know, I, my, my worry would, depends on what lens you're using. If you're using a longer focal length lens, again, like as George was saying, longer focal lens, you know, is gonna, your subject's gonna be more narrow. And like, you know, that's what you would shoot wildlife with. Or like he said, if you wanna shoot something close, you're gonna have a tighter image. That would be okay. But if you're shooting a really wide angle lens on something like that, believe it or not, a lot of times, like I have my real wide lens, if I don't, all the way click on the um the lens hood the hood that it comes with you'll see it in the fringes yeah. of the image so you could actually something like that if it protrudes too much or even like if you put on too thick of a filter sometimes you'll see the ring of the filter on the outside of the image so that'd be my only concern with those would be wide angle lenses um yeah lens caps i it's a pet peeve of mine when people don't use them so <laughs> you see people walking around and have a lens cap on i don't know why it always drives me nuts but People do that. <laughs> so, so put your lens cap on. Yeah. Darn it. <laughs> and a lens cap keeper. We, yeah. used to, we used to fire cinematographers for that. Yeah, right. We'd fire them. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'd first, I mean, we, I mean, first, we, first we bill them for the lens replacement, then we'd fire them. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's like a very easy, simple thing to do. It takes like a second and you're talking, I mean, especially you're talking cinematographers are using cine lenses, which are like super expensive. So it's like yeah. you have a seven, eight, 10, 12, $20,000 lens and you're not going to put a $3 cap on it because you're too lazy or too slow. Correct. You don't deserve to be working. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Everybody take care of your junk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But use it. Great quote. You know, you got to use it, but Great take quote. care of it. You know, they're, you know, I do see some people that are too so precious with their gear. They don't use it. You're like, oh, I have this lens. I didn't want to bring it. I didn't want to break it. I'm like, well, then why did you buy it? You know, you know, use it. I've broken a lens. Most photographers I know have broken lenses, broken cameras. You know, it's yeah. part of doing it. You know, I've never known of a pro that's been doing this for a long time that hasn't broken something. So, yeah, know. I've broken bonds, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I got this body. I use it. What can I say? <laughs> exactly. All right. All right, everybody. Hey, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I know there's probably still more questions and great tips and stuff out there. We've just scratched the surface of this. Obviously, it's a pretty you know, deep topic and you could go really deep into even just one little aspect of this. So um, we, might, we might talk about this again, some other point and maybe go into a, um, you know, one particular 
you know, subject at some point if there's an interest in that. But I want to say thanks to everybody for, for joining. I'm going to grab a quick screenshot before we go. So, you know, one more time I'll say raise a glass or raise your hand and we will uh, do a quick screenshot. Hey, cheers, everybody. And um, we'll see you next week. I'm going to try again. I will still be using Eventbrite, I think, next week. And uh, maybe we'll iron out the, the kinks in the process so that it's not so difficult for folks to find the link to Zoom. How does that work? How do you, how do you get to the call? So uh, you should have gotten an email reminder. If you signed up and bought a, a free ticket to the event through Eventbrite, you should have gotten an email reminder two hours before. Okay. And and that would have said, here's a link with the details. And you go and you log into the Eventbrite page and it has a link to Zoom. How, it, did that work for anybody? Okay, so some of you, yeah, okay, good. The so problem, that's what it's how it's supposed to work. Yeah, the, pro the, problem, the problem is that exactly 7 p.m. it shuts off the ability to get back in. So if you didn't pre-register, and you go in at 701, it says this event has already started. It's full. You cannot get in. So oh, wow. That's the pro that's what happened to me. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So are you only gonna do it that way and not post the Zoom link? I, I didn't know you well, changed things so the, up. The, the, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Well, it, Post a Zoom link, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sign up for something else. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. All right. Take care. Have a, have a great week, everybody. Yep.